Good morning. This is Gina morning. Griffin, and this is the first episode of Rigorously Relevant. And the goal of this uh, recording, podcast, uh, game show, I'm not sure what it is yet, is to expose social workers to um, the opportunity to talk more about research and specifically how to get more direct practice social workers involved in research. So this morning, I have Ben Kaffestrat with me, and he's going to talk about his engagement and research and welcome aboard Ben. Thanks Gina. So why don't we start by first do you want to do you want to introduce your friend? Uh, my friend? Oh sure. <laughs> this is uh, Queen Pickles. She's making her uh, rigorous uh, uh, debut so um, she, I have a, a partner in crime here with me uh, and if this is audio only it's my one-year-old uh, French Bulldog. <laughs> Hi, Queen Pickles. I, I also have my, my 80 pound Staffordshire, but he, I don't think he's going to make an appearance today, but we'll, we'll see what he decides to do. <laughs> okay, so my first question is, tell me a little bit more about your training and how you wound up doing what you're doing at Smith College. Yeah, uh, my background is in public health and uh, largely health research. So I started um, doing uh, kind of clinical trial behavioral interventions um, with uh, risk reduction for HIV positive men. Um, that led me into feeling like what I was, what I was finding there was uh, conversations that were really about sexual risk reduction um, were fine and appropriate, but there was a, a distinct group of folks who were HIV positive. This was in the early 2000s. Uh, where the issues were really housing and uh, health insurance access and um, opportunities for sustained employment. And so really seeing that um, the kind of social safety net, social policy issues that were underlying like an individual risk taking was really a motivating factor for me to then go back and um, uh, do graduate study in public health um, in kind of social and behavioral sciences. And so that then led into doctoral work where I was really wanting to do uh, and think about kind of social policy questions around how do we use data to inform um, programs and policy decision making. And so it was really, in a, it, you know, I think the social work corollary was really kind of on a macro track, so to speak, and then spent time uh, throughout, you know, a couple different places in, in academia and public health uh, that was very sort of social work adjacent and found myself at uh, Smith College where the last couple of years I've been spending half of my time in uh, teaching the undergraduate students in statistics and data science and then half of my time uh, teaching in the school for social work that is you know very uh, solely clinically based and so it's been a it's been um, you know a, a, a really interesting moment to think about the issues at a more clinical uh, social work level or a micro level, uh, because I tend to think about research and research informing practices and policies much more at a kind of meso or, or macro level. Mm -hmm. And so that, that kind of taking it um, down from program evaluation to uh, a practice evaluation kind of question has been uh, a really interesting piece of that kind of evolution of what I think about research and how it pertains um, in terms of what a lot of the students that we're working with um, and training folks to be able to do uh, are really wanting and needing. That is really cool. That sounds like really amazing work. Um, was it, was research something you always wanted to do or, or, or how did you wind up in that area? <laughs> no, I was, um, I, I was terrible in intro stats. I like, I, I think my undergrad was in history and political science, like neither of which required, you know, I wasn't a psych major. I wasn't, yeah. I really wasn't oriented in that way. Policy research and kind of thinking about different ways of, you know, a, like historical document research. So, so different ways of thinking about what research is, uh, but not a, like an empirical quantitative kind of thing. So I've really kind of come in through the side door, you know, um, it was at that first job uh, or my main job before graduate school where I was um, brought on to folks, um, qualitative 
uh, interviews. It was sort of that sense of like, well, if you can read, you can do qualitative um, uh, analysis, which is sort of true and also very much not true. Uh, <laughs> and so, you know, I was doing uh, transcription and, and working on um, things that were uh, ultimately someone's dissertation project. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and sort of getting that kind of exposure. And then slowly but surely really kind of started migrating more into the more rigorous dimensions of, of methods. The quantitative side, uh, I found myself ended up really quantitatively, but you know, it took a lot of work. <laughs> like mm -hmm. taking interest stats multiple times in a way that really like for it all to click, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's really been a, a full process. So, um, yeah, so it's it's still sort of a little bit of a surprise to me that I am uh, sort of seen as this like big data researcher um, because it doesn't yeah it doesn't really connect with like my struggle bus as an undergrad yeah. in, in intro stats. Yeah, no, I I understand that. I had a similar experience. Like I, I had to take stats a couple of times, and it finally clicked for me when somebody told me that I should think of it as a language and not math, and that made a huge difference to me. And mm -hmm. that is sort of a lot easier so I definitely understand that yes were you able to find any mentors or any people who helped you along that path while you were trying to find yourself in this in this area you know I think that the early on um, being in a so I was in a community health center environment that had a pretty robust research group um, and so there were a lot of kind of informal mentors throughout that process that kind of demystified, de-escalated that sense of like, you need X to be able to do research, but it, it was kind of part of what everybody was doing um, mm -hmm. in, in a way that really um, lowered the barriers to entry. You didn't need to have a certain credential or, you know, there were ways to sort of like get involved in small pieces uh, mm -hmm. in, a, in, in a way that I think was really helpful and that there were folks who uh, really supported that as a dimension of growth um, early on, and then other, uh, you know, mentors through throughout graduate school have been really instrumental in sort of seeing how those different pieces kind of fit together of um, qualitative work and having kind of mentorship there, quantitative work and having having mentorship there. Um, mm -hmm. People who really appreciate the value of both, uh, and and being able to kind of you know work with a bunch of different people who uh, rely on or, or value those different sorts of methods and play different roles in different projects. So in some mm -hmm. projects, I, I actually am more on the qualitative side uh, mm -hmm. and on some projects, I'm more on the quantitative side and having folks in sort of mentory roles that support each of those different pieces of, of kind of what I bring to the table in terms of research has been, uh, mm -hmm. has been really, really helpful. Can you demystify that part of the process? Like, um, how do you decide, and at what point do you decide if you're going to use qualitative methods or quantitative methods, and who's going to do what on a project? Yeah, it's, um, you know, I, I, I have found at least that at a certain point, I think people really have established an identity as you're solidly one or the other. Mm -hmm. And in that case, then having somebody who can play the other role becomes really useful. And so, to the extent that that someone can, I think they're they're happy to sort of have like you take over the qualitative piece because I can do the quant stuff. I can do a survey. I can, you know, mm -hmm. oversee those analyses. But I don't know what to do with themes, uh, mm -hmm. and so uh, and vice versa of working with anthropologists who are you know strong ethnographers who mm -hmm. understand the statistical pieces enough and understand survey work uh, and really get what we're trying to get out of a quantitative survey data collection, um, mm -hmm. but aren't going to be able to or want to lead those analyses. So, you know, I think being um, being kind of open and, and, and owning what you're interested in, being flexible and, um, and cultivating relationships with a variety of different types of people and, and not, uh, you know, I think I'm, I'm I just sort of see myself as a, a bit more of a generalist in a lot of ways. And I mm -hmm. think that opens up a lot of opportunities um, for, for places where, um, you know, when I'm playing one role that I still get to learn from the other side of things, um, mm -hmm. which has been really kind of exciting. It's, it's like, I'm going to be able to 
do the things that I know well and know how to do, but I still get to learn from you uh, mm -hmm. about the, the, you know, the way that you approach your qualitative work and that mm -hmm. informs my qualitative work on another project. And that's been a really fun part of that process. Um, mm -hmm. No, that sounds that sounds really fun. Um, what generally, how long does it take from the time you start to submit that IRB paperwork to the time where you're done gathering data and you can start writing this up and it's a done thing? Like, how long does that usually take? Good question. It I, it depends a little bit on the project um, and uh, whether there's or whether there is or how much data collection there is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think for qualitative stuff that I, I've really come to appreciate how long that takes. And mm -hmm. I think it's, it's a way that quantitative researchers uh, often um, are dismissive of, like, you only have 30 interviews, um, <laughs> you know, or something like that. But it's like, if you could understand how long that, you know, how arduous it is to transcribe 30 interviews that are an hour and a half long or, you know, mm -hmm. whatever. Um, uh, and really appreciate the rigor of absorbing yourself into those transcripts in a way that really come up with themes. Um, it, it can take a while. So for, you know, a lot of the kind of some of those smaller projects that that I've uh, worked on um, where we're able to do things more quickly, I'd say it's, you know, a couple months to get through an IRB and then uh, um, a month or two of, of data collection if you're really able to recruit quickly. And mm -hmm. then I would say probably another six months to a year at least to get mm -hmm. the kind of initial analyses out. So probably, you know, a year, year and a half in total. Um, mm -hmm. But there are ways, I think, to to do things more quickly. Um, and uh, especially for, for clinical social workers or, or clinicians in other capacities, there are ways to do things that I think look a lot like research that are more informing internal processes and don't need that IRB and they don't need to be researched in that way. And I, I think we, in some ways, don't really talk about how your research skills can really inform mm -hmm. that like quality improvement kind of stuff that doesn't require an IRB, but, but really could still be rigorous and inform you mm -hmm. advocating to, to the executive director that you need more money to support this program. It doesn't need to be a peer reviewed publication necessarily, but, but you could still be using all of those um, more rigorous kind of skills that you develop in a research course. So, you know, those, those are, I think are, are, are can be faster to, um, mm -hmm. to proceed through. And, you know, if there are ways to do work that's uh, reasonable, ethical, fair, um, but doesn't require uh, an IRB, uh, mm -hmm. You know, I think those are those are really useful to consider. Mm -hmm. Just to speed yeah, things up. Yeah, I've been reading a lot about um, community-based research and um, um, uh, PBRNs and academic um, social workers and direct practice social workers and um, other stakeholders in uh, clinical settings working together. Um, and usually, it seems like those projects take a little bit less time to turn around and the research questions are determined by the people who are working in that setting so they actually get the information that they want it happens a lot more quickly Definitely. have you seen any of those types of projects in action or, or could you tell us a little bit more about those yeah but i mean some of the projects i've i've never really done um, a lot of true community-based participatory research i have friends mm -hmm. and colleagues who have mm -hmm. um what what I have been more involved in is uh, projects where we, you know, we really want to cultivate a strong, um, like, community advisory board to inform and advise the research questions um, mm -hmm. and the analysis and the interpretation and how it gets informed back to um, some sense of a community. And that mm -hmm. part takes a lot of time, uh, mm -hmm. and, and and it's relationship building and it's. Um, you know, it's really being open and, and able to learn from um, from people's lived experiences that academic researchers uh, in particular are not necessarily very good at. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we want to kind of in the ivory tower come up with a research question and like go out into like the lab and test it. Mm -hmm. So that um, the, the connections that I see in uh, particularly in field settings or in community-based mental health settings and social work, I think are ripe for those opportunities to really, there are existing relationships and to be able to kind of like mm -hmm. add a new dimension that's really more of a research focus. Um, mm -hmm. it, in my experience, that's been a place that 
the amount of time uh, you spend building those relationships uh, early on and, and over time with a small project and then kind of a medium sized project and then a larger project and you really have built that trust um, and, and established a rapport I think can be really useful but takes a lot of time to, to do. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the work I have going on right now is uh, intervention work with um, queer folks with prostate cancer and thinking about um, quality of life after uh, prostate cancer treatment. And mm -hmm. so, you know, we've been working with community partners all along, but it was, it was this really intentional uh, development of identifying those relationships, kind of crafting them slowly over time through writing the initial proposals. We mm -hmm. had a two year kind of exploratory or pilot study where they were really closely involved, encouraging them to be writing up or leading pieces of uh, research results from that as a way to um, to cultivate their backgrounds and research as, as and leading pieces of the analysis. And then that really solidified our relationship in a way that has helped us move forward for um, recruiting with them and through them um, and for them to be really avid partners in coming up with the research questions and, and analyzing that data. You said um, something about being able to make connections so that um, those projects can start to come together. How, one of the things that I think is really important is that um, the academic uh, social workers and clinical social workers should start to have those types of conversations because there's a lot of writing that's starting to come out about, not surprisingly, rigor and relevance. So this knowing um, how or this knowing what and, and, and how do we get those two things together. So how do you see those two, um, those two areas being able to make the connections they need to be able to do that type of work? Yeah, it's, um, you know, in thinking from the academic side that all of the uh, schools of social work that are uh, accredited by CSWE, the Council on Social Work Education, uh, you know, one of their standard principles is practice informed research and research informed practice. And I think because that's that sort of terminology has been around for a while, it almost becomes this kind of like that could fit to anything yeah. in a way that it's sort of lip service almost. So I think those. Um, you know, to, it's, like to, this, it's like this mantra, but it's just a mantra. <laughs> yes, exactly. So it's just like, it becomes just like buzzwords, right? <laughs> that you can sort of say, yes, this is that. But to really do that, right? To really have um, clinical scholars and practitioners saying, here's what we need. Like, here's what mm -hmm. the field needs. Here's what we need in our agency. Here's what I need in my practice is to know that whatever, 20% of my clients are coming in presenting with this particular kind of um, you know, PTSD because of these different types of trauma. And I don't know where to go with that. I don't know what to do with that. Um, or all of the research is based in, um, you know, population that really doesn't apply to mine. And so there are ways to, you know, I think that to be able to have those links between practitioners and researchers, and frankly, for the incentives on, on either side to be such that it would make sense to do that kind of research. In other words, you know, a lot of academic social workers or, or researchers are, are motivated by grants or you know, really need an infrastructure to do that kind of work. And clinicians, it's like, why, you know, why carve out, you, you don't have enough time to like make I'm notes. I'm tired, I don't have time to write my notes. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, so it is, you know, I can appreciate the like, that kind of organizational structural pieces that prevent that from really happening, but it would be, mm -hmm. I think really powerful to see it come to come to fruition more more often um, mm -hmm. and we, we see that a, a bit more in our doctoral students who I think have been in practice for a while and then come mm -hmm. back and um, and are wanting to think more about research or leadership in different capacities um, but really bring that clinical relevance in but there's I think there's got to be a way to be doing a better job of partnering um, and being able to kind of meet um, meet somewhere along the way. I hope so. Yeah, I'm definitely trying to uh, help find ways to facilitate that. Um, let's take a little bit of a left turn and talk a little bit more about data science. Um, mm. How specifically did you become involved in data science and, and what made it interesting to you? Yeah, I think, it, you know, in some ways it, it really goes back to, uh, for me, that, that interest in um, in doing research that's using data to inform programs, practices, and, and policies. 
Uh, and that data science in a lot of ways really does that and at scale. Um, so even in, you know, in the last 15 years or so, um, to really see the amounts of data that have come uh, become available, the computing power that's become available, you know, not to just sort of go through this like big data is going to change the world. But the reality is there just is a lot more of different kinds of data than, than we have really ever had access to historically. And so um, needing to think about, uh, and, and in some ways taking pretty standard um, statistical approaches like a regression model and thinking mm -hmm. about that or, or basic data visualization and thinking about that in ways that could really harness the, the computational power that we have to make those more dynamic and interactive data visualizations um, mm -hmm. or to uh, you know some of the pieces around data science of reproducible research I think really um, uh, integrate well with like what some of the academic disciplines of you know psychology social work uh, many uh, have, have needed. And so there's been a real synergy that I see around both the methods and also in some ways sort of like what are the priorities and like the tone of, uh, of a lot of the data science work um, really, really being kind of integrated there. And it also, I think, um, going back to that sort of sense of like being a generalist, it, you know, I think has allowed me to think about um, data science approaching text data uh, with like natural language processing and having been a qualitative researcher looking for themes, really being able to assess and critique the data-driven approaches, the, the kind of computationally data-driven approaches and how those are useful and for what purpose uh, as different than, you know, a, a grounded theory kind of thematic analysis. So uh, I think it's been really helpful actually to uh, to bring in that that kind of mixed methods perspective and, and have a sense of the different pieces and really be able to critique and scale uh, or as people scale a lot of the data science stuff um, mm -hmm. uh, of who who's included like who owns the data there's a lot of the you know uh, data science data ethics questions mm -hmm. that I think social workers are really well positioned to to inform and, and really be thinking about um, mm -hmm. that you know, is just uh, largely absent in that uh, the data science sort of discussions right now. So, mm -hmm. I agree. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about the self-directed modules that you created and that we're going to be using on the website? Yeah. So, part of what I um, for for thinking about data science and, and uh, that progression in has been using uh, statistical packages like or, or rather statistical languages like R um, mm -hmm. and um, and one of the things that I think it's really offered is that reproducibility so being able to keep everything into one place so I write mm -hmm. all of my papers um, in the same kind of document uh, that has all of the statistical analysis and code along with the text and the citations and the tables and the figures and it's all in one place. And mm -hmm. the benefit of that is really to be able to, for somebody to take that uh, off, you know, a publicly available website and literally reproduce it with essentially the click of a button. Mm -hmm. So that, that approach with R has also lended itself to um, to a variety of different things that R can, can offer. Um, and one of them is uh, a lot of interactive kinds of approaches. And so uh, what I created uh, are some interactive modules where um, there's a bunch of text within uh, a given section on a given topic that explains things uh, you know, similar to sort of a self-directed study on whatever the topic was, data visualization, let's say. And then there's an interactivity where there's some sample code that you're able to run. You can click run and then look at, it could generate, say, a map of which states include um, which sorts of questions on a survey. That's one that uh, uh, I've been working on for, for other kinds of projects. Mm -hmm. And then you're able to kind of interact with, oh, I see that you, know, you can sort of assess like there's more going on uh, in New York than there is in this other state or something along those lines. 
mm -hmm. be able to interact with it and feel that sense of, okay, I'm running this code, I'm telling R what to do, I'm seeing the output, I'm able to work with it, but to really lower the barrier into, I need to know, you know, I need to download a bunch of software, I need to learn how to do all of these things, that it, it, I think the idea, the goal has really been to um, create these kind of interactive pieces that let you start quickly, start from scratch, and then take that and start to build or kind of scaffold that into bigger pieces and processes where you could go and do a full analysis from kind of start to finish um, on, on your own. Mm -hmm. I, I think these are amazing pieces and I think that they're going to be a huge benefit and thank you so much for letting us use that for the website. I'm really excited about that. Yeah. So anything else that you feel like you'd like to tell us or do you have any advice, especially for direct practice social workers who really want to be more involved in research and, and get their feet wet? Yeah, I think there's, um, you know, there are a, a, a lot of ways within, uh, within agency settings uh, to be doing more research. And, and I'd encourage folks to, uh, to engage with, uh, with some of more of that work um, and, and kind of seeing things that are questions that you have. You may not have the time to, to be addressing, but um, you, you know, to put it out on social media, like that may be something that you could find a partner um, to, to help you do. Um, so, you know, as you're seeing, as, I think as, as direct practitioners are seeing things that they wish that they knew or wish that they had in their mm -hmm. practice that would really inform what they're able to do with a client or a group or a family, mm -hmm. um, I think uh, it would be great to see more of that discussion happening um, or in places where those discussions could happen. And, and I think likewise that uh, researchers need to be going out and cultivating those relationships more um, and, mm -hmm. and use the experience that the uh, direct practice folks are able to see um, in mm -hmm. ways that are, uh, would be informing the kind of research questions that an academic sees as, as informative, as important, whatever. And then there's a bunch of um, other ways, uh, certainly in the data science world, to start doing um, coding workshops, uh, kind mm -hmm. of hackathons, a mm -hmm. lot of uh, great opportunities uh, uh, that are uh, ways to start working on projects that are in the nonprofit um, and sort of mission-driven space. It's not just data science to support uh, some for-profit company, but there are a lot of opportunities to kind of volunteer. So, uh, and, and also, uh, you know, one of the things about the R community that I think has been really great is there are uh, great resources for people to, uh, to be supported as they learn. And so if you're a, if you're a, a direct practice worker who is interested in developing some of those skills, I think there's a lot of resources available if you're able to kind of pick at it a little bit. Every week there's a Tidy Tuesday and you can learn to create data visualizations along with a community of other folks. Uh, mm -hmm. There are Slack workspaces who are kind of going through core texts uh, in, in, in R and people are really coming to it from all different disciplines and places. So mm -hmm. there's a, a, a really lovely and supportive community within the R kind of world uh, that mm -hmm. I think makes it more approachable for, for folks who have probably felt excluded from or just uninterested in, in research, but the, um, that, it, that it can really be a, a rewarding community that embraces a lot of that diversity of kind of perspective and um, backgrounds. Absolutely. I so just absolutely, do it. <laughs> yeah, I absolutely agree. And I have to, of course, give a shout out to our ladies, which um, supports yes. women who are trying to learn coding. So that was an excellent conversation. Thank you so much for getting up on a Saturday morning and helping yes, me. Thank you. Okay. And um, I look forward to having the stuff up on the website and we'll talk again soon. Sounds great. Okay. Bye. 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 <laughs>